Hi everyone, Professor Davis here, and we're going to get into our part two of the musculoskeletal system diseases and disorders. Part one focused mostly in on diseases that dealt with kind of wear and tear or genetic basis. We're going to now look and switch gears and look more at like trauma, cancers, and some of the rare types of diseases in this group. All right, so when we're talking about neoplasms that deal with the musculoskeletal system, we can see that primary neoplasms of this system are actually very uncommon. You don't find them very often to where the cancer starts in the bone or starts in the muscle, okay? Now, cancer can move to the muscle and move to the bone from a secondary area, like it's, it's gonna come from it metastasizing from things like lung cancer, breast cancer, or prostate cancer, but the tumors do grow in the bone or the muscle, they just did not originate there. Now there are a few that do originate in these areas and one is osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma is the most common primary tumor that's found in the bone. Now, the problem with osteosarcoma is it is actually highly malignant. It will spread very easily. We do find that it spreads very quickly, and even with removing the tumors in the sense of removing the bones that it initially starts in, it can spread very easily to other parts of the body. The next one is rhabdomyosarcoma. This one is very rare. It's also a highly malignant uh, tumor, but this is one found in the skeletal muscle. Okay, so again, osteosarcoma is what we find in the bone. Rhabdomyosarcoma is what we see in the skeletal muscle. Both of these, because they are rare, they are very highly malignant. They spread very easily. Treatment has to be very aggressive in these cases. And with that aggressive treatment, that includes high levels of certain chemotherapy drugs, surgical removal of certain areas, things like that. Prognosis is actually not very good with these two types of cancers. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is gonna be trauma. And especially when we're talking about the skeletal system, trauma with this is gonna deal a lot around with breaks or what we call fractures. So fractures are a break in the actual bone. And there are lots of different types of fractures. And so this is just listing some of the different types. You have like things that are stress fractures. A lot of times those can be pathological, meaning there's an underlying disease that's causing it, either an infection like osteomyelitis, or there could be actually an issue with like osteoporosis. Some fractures are considered open. These are known as compound fractures where the skin is broken in the process of the break. Okay, those have higher risks of infections, whereas closed or simple fractures are going to be where the skin is not broken. Now the bones could still be broken pretty bad. It just means the skin's not broken. There can be complete fractures or there can be incomplete fractures where it's not broken all the way through. And in kids, when it's only partially broken, we call those green stick fractures. Um, we also can have displaced fractures, commuted or compressed. There's also impacts that can happen or avulsions where it's like a twisting that takes place that breaks the bone. Some of these breaks could be longitudinal where the bone breaks, you know, long ways. Others are going to be transverse, horizontal. They could have an oblique break. They could be spiral or they could be a stellate. We also see intercapsular and extracapsular types of breaks. There's also an issue if the like neck of a certain bone breaks off, like the femur where the head breaks off of the neck or in the radi or the, sorry, the humerus where that can occur. There's also Coley's fractures and Potts fractures. Those are specific to either the wrist or the fibula in the leg. And so there are lots of different types. And so these next few slides, you're gonna be looking at some pictures with this. So pathologic can be caused by weakness in the bone. Open fractures, the skin is open, whereas closed, the skin is intact. A Coley's fracture is found in the wrist. Okay, and so in the wrist, if the if they break right here on the, um, I believe it's the radial end, yeah, fracture, um, and it is named after the physician who saw it over and over again, decided to name it, so it's called the Coley's fracture. We can also have fracture where the neck of the, or uh, the neck of the femur is broken, where the head actually comes off, and you can see that here. A lot of times that requires a type of hip replacement that takes place. You also have green stick fractures. It's not fully broken. Commuted means it's all in little pieces. Compression is when they compress on each other. Two bones compress. Impact is going to be where the bone gets forced on each other and it causes a break. Impact fractures happen a lot, especially in car wrecks where the legs get pushed back, especially if they're on the dashboard. That's a big issue. And so there's lots of different fractures here. 
Last but not least, this one shows you longitudinal, transverse, oblique, spiral, or stellate is like with the kneecap where it splinters out. And so there's a lot of different types and classifications when we're talking about fractures. But guys, no matter what the fracture is, there are certain treatments we want to do if the bone is broken. And so the main thing that needs to happen anytime a bone is thought to be broken is we need to do immobilization. We need the patient to stop moving. And there's a reason for this is if those bones break and the bone marrow is potentially going to be able to leak out, we want to try to prevent them of being a fat embolism that takes place. Remember in your long bones, most of that bone marrow is yellow bone marrow, which means it's fat bone marrow. If it gets into your bloodstream, it can cause little bubbles and it causes a type of embolism. It's almost like a stroke, but instead of a blood clot, it's from a fat kind of clot in that sense from the bone. So we want to immobilize it as quickly as possible. The next thing is that we want to do a reduction. Now this reduction could be closed if there's no opening in the tissues they might be able to set the actual bones especially if it was like a clean break and not a lot of pieces they can set the bones and cast it okay and then they would just monitor to see to make sure that they are healing properly in other cases we may need to do an open reduction and an open reduction means we're surgically going to go in and we are going to set those bones and then ultimately probably cast them as well Another type of treatment that might be done is traction, especially if the bones were compressed, okay, or they've been impacted. We may need to do a type of traction where it pulls the bones apart a little bit so that they can heal properly since they were kind of pushed together. It's going to realign them for that purpose. Um, complications though that can happen when it comes to treatment here is sometimes if we don't get it set just right there could be a malunion where it doesn't actually fuse correctly there could be a non-union union where it does not it's not even close enough at all so the bone does not heal together at all we see that there could also be an issue where necrosis sets in if the if the blood supply is affected to that particular area and infection especially if it's an open fracture there's an increased chance of infection All right, the next one we want to look at are strains and sprains. And guys, there is a difference. So when we look at a strain, this is an overstretching injury of the muscle. So the ST, the strain, is a muscle injury. Now, this is going to be where the muscle or the tendon that attaches to the, mus the muscle to the actual bone is affected. Okay, the main thing with a strain treatment is going to be rest, moist heat, painkillers and anti-inflammatories. Those are going to be the main things we're going to do for somebody who has a strain. The main symptoms that the patient will feel if they have a strained muscle is going to be soreness, pain, and tenderness. And so again, this is where the whole point of the heat, the painkillers, and the anti-inflammatories will help treat that. On the other hand, we can have what we call a sprain. Now, the SP sprain is going to be a traumatic injury to the joint. Specifically, it's going to deal more with the ligaments of the joint. Those are chat attachments of bone to bone. Now the treatment here is going to be what we call RICE. The RICE stands for rest, ice, compression because this is to reduce swelling, and elevation because most of the time the symptoms for a sprain are going to be swelling, pain, heat, and redness because of all of the inflammation in the area. Okay, and guys, this particular picture is showing you the different grades of a sprain. So you have what the normal ligament should look like in the ankle. Then you have a grade one sprain. They're showing you they're very irritated. They're all stretched a little. If you go to a grade two, you can see that some of them have little micro tears. And if you go to grade three, there are some major tears throughout these tendon or sorry, these ligaments that are present. So there is a difference between a strain and a sprain. Another thing we want to look at are called dislocations and subluxations. Now these are going to involve the bone and the joint, but the bone does not actually break. So the first one is a dislocation. Dislocation is a complete separation of the bone from its normal position. This causes pain and joint deformity. Okay, and so it's a complete removal out of the normal joint. On the other hand, if we look at subluxation, subluxation means a partial separation of the bone from its normal position. So the whole thing hasn't moved, only a little bit. Okay, and so a dislocation is going to be more severe than a subluxation, but both of them are going to have very similar symptoms. They're going to have acute pain, 
the joint is going to look deformed like you can see here you can see that that elbow that hu the head of the humerus is sticking out like it shouldn't it needs to be popped back in and they will have rapid swelling in the area treatment is reduction we need to put it back in place okay we need to get it back in there and reposition it to where it is going to hopefully not do this again However, once a joint has dislocated once, there's a higher risk that it will dislocate again. All right, the next we wanna look at is low back pain. Uh, low back pain is a very common disorder and there is going to be a lot of potential causes. It could be acute or chronic. Some of the causes are gonna be things like obesity, poor posture, weak abdominal muscles can contribute to low back pain. Improper lifting is another one that can cause a lot of low back pain. If it's an acute type of low back pain, it's short term. Chronic means it's going to be long term. Treatment. How do we treat low back pain? Well, we can use moist heat. So hot heat packs will help with this. Um, analgesics, so painkillers, anti-inflammatories, and then muscle relaxants. And when we look at the muscle relaxants, guys, the big thing there is to reduce lumbar spasms. If the muscles are spasming and we need to reduce those so that the patient can get some relief. Now, back pain could progress to something else. Since you're dealing with the spine, it may not just be the muscles that are the potential issue. If the spine itself is going to have some issues, this, this could be a herniated nucleus pulposus. This is also known a lot of times as a herniated disc. It could also be a rupture disc, a slip disc, or a bulging disc. They all mean pretty much the same thing. What happens here is that the actual center part in between each vertebrae, there's a set of cartilage and it has kind of a nucleus area inside that cartilage that is a little more of like a cushion. If that protrudes out, it herniates out of that normal area, it slips out of where it should be, it's going to end up putting pressure on spinal nerves. And these spinal nerves can cause lots of pain. And one of the main ones with the low back is that it puts pressure on the sciatic nerve, which is the big nerve that goes and services your leg. Now, with this, we need to do treatment as the same as low back pain treatment. But if it starts to get really severe and it really puts compression, we need to go in and fix this and surgical procedures are going to be what does that. Okay, so surgical procedures are going to be what potentially can slip those back in. Another one is traction. They can end up pulling and it can hopefully help slip those discs back in. If not, and they end up rupturing where the fluid gets released and it's more bone on bone with your vertebrae, they may need to go in and fuse that up. It reduces motion, but it does help give you more support and alleviate some of the pain. The next thing we want to look at is called bursitis. Bursitis is an inflammation of a special area around your joint called the bursa. Now, bursa are small fluid-filled sacs near your joints, and the whole point of the bursas are to reduce friction. As these tendons rub against bone, as these ligaments rub against bone, they could potentially fray them, kind of like a rope rubbing against like a rock. It could fray it. We don't want that to happen. We want there to be reduced friction so that the movements in your joints are more smooth and not painful. And so bursa are there to help do this. They help reduce friction when you have movement. The problem is, is in bursitis, the bursa actually get inflamed. When they get inflamed, they can cause severe pain and limit your motion. They can do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. A main example of this is tennis elbow, and this occurs a lot of times, most commonly, um, due to repetitive movements. That's why it's considered tennis elbow. Um, if they do a repetitive movement over and over again in that particular joint, bursitis can ultimately develop. The main treatments for bursitis is going to be moist heat, painkillers, and anti-inflammatory agents. Um, sometimes even doing some physical therapy might be helpful for bursitis. Now, tendonitis is where we have inflammation of the actual tendon or connective tissue that attaches the muscle to the bone. That's what a tendon is. It attaches muscle to bone. This may occur in any tendon. So it, any tendon in your body could potentially be prone to being inflamed with tendonitis. It is most commonly going to happen in the shoulder. It's also due to repetitive movements, but the bursa are not involved here. This is just the tendons. 
So treatment are going to be things like ice, again, analgesics, so painkillers, anti-inflammatories, certain exercises, and surgery might be needed in some cases, especially if inflammation continues to kind of get out of control. And I'm going to talk about an example in a minute where this tendonitis causes more severe issues in certain areas. So one of these where tendonitis can progress and become more of a problem, be more problematic, is in the wrist. This is known as carpal tunnel syndrome. It is repetitive motion or injury that affects the hands, and it affects individuals a lot of times working with repetitive tasks. This means requiring like finger or wrist motions. They found that people who type a lot, that sort of thing, can develop carpal tunnel. We are seeing it more often, though, due to this number. Repetitive movements with texting or gaming can also potentially cause carpal tunnel. When we look at symptoms with carpal tunnel, there's going to be numbness, pain, swelling, coolness, and discoloration in the hands and fingers. And this is because, guys, the inflammation of that tendon that runs across here, it's a sheath, it starts to put pressure on anything running through this small area. This includes blood vessels, nerves, um, all those things, which gives most of our symptoms we see with carpal tunnel. Treatment is going to be rest. They may splint the hand in order to help with letting the inflammation die down where you're not using using it as much. Anti-inflammatories may be present or be used to physical therapy, but surgery may need to happen in order to open that up. And so that way it takes pressure off of those nerves and blood vessels. Another issue when we're talking a lot about that connection with the muscle to the bone with tendons is going to be plantar fasciitis. Uh, plantar fasciitis is also known as calcaneal spurs or heel spurs. Those are found when we talk about the um, sole of your foot. Okay, it's a lot of times the arch. Um, symptoms with this, when we look, is going to be pain in the heel that is worse when you're taking the first few steps, especially after you've been sitting for a long time or standing in one place for a long time. Um, when you get first get out of bed in the morning, it's going to be pretty severe or beginning of an exercise routine. Um, the big thing with treatment for this is going to be rest, ice, um, painkillers, anti-inflammatories, uh, but also having really good shoes is going to help. Okay, having support in your arches and the bottom of your foot, your heels. Avoiding going barefoot because being barefoot is going to put more pressure on that, cause more issues. Um, and also stretching that tendon out. You can a lot of times use it by if you have a tennis ball on the floor and you can rub your foot against that tennis ball. There's also special tools you can find even just like at Walmart or other stores like that that can help if you have plantar fasciitis. And it just stretches out that tendon. The next area we want to look at are your shoulder and knee disorders. One particular one we talk about the shoulder is called rotator cuff issues. And if you've torn your rotator cuff, that's a big deal. There's tiny little muscles that help hold everything in place in that shoulder, and it could potentially cause some major pain um, for the patient. This is where the muscles that hold the head of the humerus in the shoulder socket area have been hurt somehow, whether it's the tendon or the muscle itself. We can diagnose this with a CT scan, but it has to have surgical repair for the most part in order to regain our range of motion in the shoulder. It is commonly found in injuries for certain sports like baseball, basketball, and even tennis. The big thing too is once you end up having the surgery, it needs to be immobilized where you don't move the shoulder very much for about three to four weeks. And then you're going to start doing very subtle exercises through physical therapy to try to regain that motion in your shoulder. The next one is found in the knee, and this is a torn meniscus. The meniscus are attached to the top of the tibia, and they provide kind of like a pillow or cushion for the femur, so it's not bone on bone in that knee joint. It gives a type of cushion in between. The problem is, is that if you have a sudden twisting, locking, or giving way of pain after you have injured that knee, it could be a good indication that the meniscus is the problem. What happens is, is this area, because it's cartilage, is avascular, so it can't heal on its own. It doesn't have a good blood supply. And it can like curl up, kind of like when you get a hangnail on your hand. It doesn't cause you much problem until you catch it on something and you're like, oh, that really hurt. It's kind of the same thing with the cartilage. It folds up and if it catches in the joint just the right way, it causes the joint to lock. It causes it to give way. It causes more problems for the patient. So mostly when we talk about a meniscus, if it starts to cause a lot of those issues, they have to go in surgically and they shave it off in order to stop that catching from occurring. 
The last one we talk about here with shoulder and knee disorders is a cruciate ligament tear. The cruciate ligaments are found in between the femur and the tibia. They hold the joint together in the knee. Um, the front one's called the anterior cruciate ligament or the ACL, and the back one's called the posterior cruciate ligament or the PCL. They cross in this section in order to give stabilization to the knee so that when you like stop real quick, the knee doesn't just like keep going. The femur doesn't keep going from the tibia. It helps hold it and kind of stop that movement. If this is not present, it causes a lot of an, uh, instability. It causes the leg to start to go to like a jello. You can't really continue to play certain sports or do certain activities if you do not have these cruciate ligaments. The main way to fix these is of course through surgery and to order to repair them, doing physical therapy to regain the strength and build that knee back up. I have had an ACL reconstruction when I was 16. I tore my ACL playing basketball and had to have it reconstructed my junior year. The next one we want to talk about are shin splints. Shin splints are an overuse injury specifically to the periosteum, and so that's the outer covering of the bone where muscles do attach to the shin, specifically the lower leg, which we call the tibia. It's the bone that's the tibia or the shin bone. This can occur routinely with sudden increase in activity or new exercise routines or things that are very repetitive, like running on uneven surfaces. Shin splints can occur or even hard surfaces like gym floors, things like that. Symptoms are going to be pain and tenderness along the inner aspect of the tibia across the shin and treatment's going to be rest, analgesics, um, anti-inflammatories, heat, and ice. All right, so now we're going to look at some of these rare diseases, things that you don't see as often, but they still can affect this musculoskeletal system. The first one is De Quaven's disease or tendinitis. This is going to be a tendinitis specifically of the thumb. Okay, so the thumb itself, due to that thumb motion coming across here, it's going to cause pain down the forearm that occurs, and it's a special type of tendinitis that affects the thumb. Another one is tuberculosis of the bone. Now, if you recall, tuberculosis is normally a respiratory issue. It is a bacteria that is going to get into the lungs and it potentially causes some major issues in the respiratory system. The problem is, is that tuberculosis doesn't just stay in the lungs. It can end up traveling to any tissue of the body. This mycomia bacteria tuberculosis can end up anywhere. And if it deposits into the tissue cavities of the bone, it can cause bone weakness and pain and ultimately cause pathologic fractures where the bones break due to weakness due to infection. Infection. Another one is called Paget's disease. This is a chronic metabolic bone disease that affects bone formation. And in this case, this is a quality versus quantity thing. In our bone, we would want better quality bones. If our bones have a very they grow really fast, but it's poor quality. It makes them very weak. And this is what happens with pagets. So the breaking down of the bone is going to be slower than the building. And the building happens so quickly that the that it's kind of like cutting corners. Like if you pay the lowest bid and they cut all these corners to build your house and then your house is not stable anymore because it was using poor techniques and poor resources. The same thing happens here with pagets where the bones are being made but they're poor quality and so it causes them to be weaker and they break more often. Another one here, oh, and also if you have Paget's disease, it does increase your risk for bone cancer because of the way it's growing so quickly. Um, the last one here is Masthenia gravis. In this particular case, it's an autoimmune disorder. It's characterized by muscle weakness and, the, and the, the muscles being very fatigued and tired. This is a type of autoimmune disorder, which was discussed more in the autoimmune video. Now, last but not least in this particular chapter, let's talk about effects of aging. In the musculoskeletal system, especially when we talked about in video one, a lot of those potential issues were due to aging process. It's a normal thing that happens in the aging process that our bones start to lose their density. They are not as strong as they should be with osteoporosis. We see that there's a wear and tear that happens on your joints that potentially causes more issues as you age. The muscles lose strength as well as lose mass as you age as well. The older you are, the weaker those get. Um, we do see that there's also change in the vertebral discs and there can be a compression of the vertebrae, especially when we talk about the idea of osteoporosis. This can actually change the height of the person and it can cause the curvature. That's why you see a lot of little old ladies, if they're hunched over and they have that humpback, 
it's due to the fact of aging with osteoporosis. Um, we do see there's an increased chance of arthritis as you age. Your healing, if you do break your bones, the healing time is also going to take a whole lot longer because the healing process has decreased as you age. And you see more safety issues come into play, especially due to balance, because balance becomes an issue as you get older. And if you fall, your bones will break a lot easier as you're older due to this weakness that you have. And so we want to make sure like trip hazards and things like that are not as big of an issue for older people. So you want to take those precautions, kind of like how you baby proof your house. You may have to do a little more of that with the elderly to try to prevent issues because of their bones and muscles getting weaker. All right, so this finishes up the musculoskeletal chapter. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Mm -hmm.